Now that we've got the screen up, we're here at our starting page of the Octoplant Pro Hub. And really, the Octoplant Pro Hub is designed to support both shop floor users and supervisory users. And it does so with a very, very simple setup. Let's have a quick look. On the top right hand corner, you will see all your different settings, the profile settings, the general settings, online help, you can click here, there's language settings here, and there is a help and contact button here that you can click. And on the left hand side, that's really where we can navigate into different dashboards. This is our starting screen, and we can also extend this so that we directly see what is below here. We have the shop floor overview with all the information about the shop floor. We've got the log overview, which provides you with the logging of everything that went on. And we've got the admin overview for admin users to better understand and manage the system. And then here we've got the asset management capabilities that we're now launching as a beta and that I'll dive into in a second. And we have our custom reports here at the bottom where you can save your individually created or adjusted dashboards. Now, let's assume you're a shop floor user. And in this case, the Octoplant Pro Hub really helps you with your day-to-day -day business because you can quickly and easily get an overview of the current backup status, for example. Click on current job status, you will see all the different servers that are currently, be, uh, that are currently shown here but you can obviously just select individual ones. So let's assume you're in the, uh, you are in the assembly USA here. You can also um, use the permissions and the user settings to ensure that the users can really only see the servers they're supposed to be seeing. So in the assembly USA, we've got a total of 48 jobs. We've got one job here in error and we've got one job here in different. If you want to know, well, what is this actually? You can click on drill through you can go through the drill through and then you get all the detailed information about this job and how it executed, when it last ran, how long it ran for and so on. If you go back to the general overview here, you can also say, well, honestly, I don't like the layout of this dashboard. Very, very easy. You click on edit and then you say, well, I don't like a donut chart, for example, so I would prefer a bar chart. Then you click on a bar chart and you get a bar chart here. You can also change colors. Really everything is up for editing. At this point, you have two options. You can either save this view and then it was created as an individual custom dashboard down here at the bottom, or you can say, well, that was just what I, what I tried and played around with and you can exit the edit mode here and then it asks you again, are you sure that you want to, say, uh, that you want to discard this or do you want to save your changes? Let's just click on discard here as an easier little process. Now, an additional question that you may ask is, how long have people been working on different components? We've really had a very exciting story with one of our customers who identified an issue with that that I'm going to show you in a second. So let's assume you are not in the assembly in the USA, but you're actually in the Mexico plant here. That gives us a little bit of a nicer overview. You can see how many of my components are currently locked. So you have 30 com uh, 20 components. 30 components in total, 20 are currently being locked, six are not locked, and four are under development. Now, if you want to have a look into these components that are locked, you can actually check on this right-hand side, how long have they been locked for? And again, you can use the drill down function. So you click on this, you see which components are locked. If you click on it, it applies a local filter to this dashboard. You then see, okay, I have two RS logics locked here. I have one um, that's, a, that's an S7 and one TR portal locked here and also two codices. But you can also get the detailed view. Again, right click on drill through, you get the drill through details and then you see all of those locked components and the additional information for that. So you can see, for example, who locked these when did they lock them and how long have they been locked for. So here you see, for example, this component has been locked for 23 days, so that's really a point in time where you may want to go um, to those people here, 22 days, you will go to Haley and you will speak to them and check are they getting on with their project or not and what's the road blocker. Because having a component that's locked for 22 days, that sounds a little bit like a red flag for me. If we look into 
let's say a different user group and we say well we're not really the shop floor users we are more of the the supervisory level users how does the octoplan pro app help you here well it helps you get a super quick and easy overview of the backup status across your installations and that way you can see if your safeguarding guidelines are actually executed on let's click on the historical job status that will give you an overview of how things happened in the past you will click you're in a supervisory level, for example, for multiple sites. Now you have an overview here that shows you the share of jobs that resulted in equal, which means that it basically shows you all of those jobs that aren't an issue because they did not result in an error or they are not different. So there were no unwanted or unplanned changes. This overview shows you, oh God, something went downhill here at some point. Now, We've got different bars in here, one at 70%, one at 30%. And you can change these thresholds and they're really just there to give you a visual guidance in terms of is this something that is critical or not. So let's assume we want to set the upper threshold at 85% and the lower threshold at 70%. Then we see that, you know, in um, on 8th of June, we had a little bit of an issue, right? We dropped with a consistency index is what we call this at 83%. So 17% of your jobs, one out of every five to six jobs went through an issue here. So it either had an error or it was different. And then it went even further down up to 68% here. 68% then means 32%. So roughly a third of your jobs resulted in an error. That really is a situation where you can now say, well, somebody will need to look into this. And if you want to identify who you're going to have to talk to, we can do that, right? We can check, is it the USA? You select up the USA here and you see, well, no, actually the consistency in the USA is pretty high. Maybe next you want to check Mexico. And here again, you see in Mexico, there were a couple of outliers here, but generally speaking, the consistency again is very high. Now, last but not least, well, actually in this case, last, look at the uh, German plant and you see that a couple of weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, really the consistency started dropping down and even further down until it was really here at 54% um, of consistency. So half of the jobs executed as an error or as different. So that really should show you there is something that needs to be done and you may want to start investigating who, is behind, um, uh, who can do what in this situation to improve your overall coverage. Now, that's not the only thing that you can do. You can also directly compare different shop floors. So click on shop floor, compare here in our, in our global filter, select all sites again, so all the data is shown here, and then say, we've set up this demo data in a way that we have our assembly Germany and assembly USA being roughly the, the, the same size. So they have roughly the same amount of components. They should have the same amount of jobs as well. So um, let's just look at that, right? So assembly Germany on the left-hand side, assembly USA on the right-hand side. You click on this and you really click on it. And then you already see, well, if I tell you the components should be roughly the same, then the jobs should roughly be the same. We immediately see on the left-hand side, the number of configured jobs in Germany is at 286 versus only 96 in the US. So your first action point and takeaway would be, you know, uh, stress with the management in the, uh, or, or with, with your uh, shop floor um, uh, users again, that they should be configuring more jobs in the US because that is the only way that you can create full coverage and that you can ensure that you are safeguarded in the case of downturn. At the same time now, it seems like the American side does a much better job at actually following the processes for these devices that they're configuring. So really the German side has to start looking into why are there so many different jobs and why are there so many errors. So from this view alone, you can directly create two action points, one for the, the one side and one for the other side. Now, let's go and speak about our asset management. The asset inventory beta dashboard is down here. Our brand new asset management, we've just launched this. We're super excited. It's launched in the Pro Hub exclusively. So this will not be available in our on-prem version. It is super helpful dashboard, especially at the shop floor users to get a better overview of the physical assets on the shop floor. 
So at the top, you see the main assets, right? And in this case, you will see a lot of Siemens PLCs and a lot of Siemens and a lot of Rockwell. What, what do we see for each of these assets? We see what server are they under, what component path, so where is it stored? And then we see the component name, the vendor, the asset category, the asset name, the model, order numbers, the firmware versions, and the network address. And down here, we have the rack slot information to actually identify what are the, the assets that are behind a certain main asset. So if we, for example, click on this Siemens PLC here, right, then we see immediately there's two additional information, two additional uh, modules down here. And for these as well, we can get the network address, we can get the asset names, the order numbers, we can get the subnet mask and the serial number in many cases. And this really is an exciting first step into the direction of being able to create your asset inventory with a click of a button. We've launched this with a slightly uh, reduced um, coverage of devices, but this is definitely something we're going to improve in the future. To get your feedback on this and to really uh, understand how we can improve this, what you would wish for the future, we've also included a little survey here. So just click on this link down here and you will be directed to that survey. It's really not a long survey. It's just so that we understand better what you need for the future. But one more thing. Let's just briefly create a custom report together, right? We've now seen asset management. We've seen all these dashboards that are there already. Let's just create one new one. Click on add a new report. Now we need to identify the data source. We will for this case use demo data that we that we set up with. It's for an energy consumption use case so that we can track what energy consumption do we actually have. You click on continue and then you will get to the dashboard creation. And I just want to show you how easy and simple it is to create a dashboard that helps you really navigate and answer a couple of good questions. So let's say we first want to create a map, right? So we have a map here and we can go in and say, um, we want to see our factories first. So you click on your server here on the right hand side is the data model. The table is the data that you imported. Uh, so the, the data that comes from you, all the rest is the Octoplant um, native data which is relatively easy to get through. It looks a little uh, intimidating in the beginning, but if you've really uh, spent a very, very short amount of time on this, you already see it's very, very intuitive to get through it. So what do we wanna see? We wanna see, first of all, what servers do I have? So I take the server here and I just drag and drop it into Legends. So that way I know immediately what servers we would have. Then we say, well, actually, we know which town it is. That comes from the table that we've imported. And that town you can put in location because that's what you see. And here you immediately see those are the, the production facilities. You've got one in Mexico, one in the United States, and one in Germany here. But now we want to see, well, how high is the energy consumption? So we take the energy consumption and just put it on bubble size. And then we can immediately compare where's energy consumption high, where's energy consumption low. So in this case, just graphically, we already see where are my factories, how high is my overall energy consumption. Now, let's say we're not satisfied with that. We want a little bit more. Let's just create an additional bar chart. Let's pull one bar chart in here and say we also want to actually see what the level of energy consumption is. So we take our energy consumption here. And again, we want energy consumption to be on the y-axis so that it shows us on the y-axis how much energy is there. But then I probably want to know where does that energy come from. So I draw the, the server onto the x-axis. So it immediately narrows this down. And then I can say, well, let's make this a little bit colorful. And I again draw the server into my legend and then this is broken down immediately. So I can now click on assembly in the US and the map up updates immediately and it also updates when I click again to, dis to deselect that filter. So again, very easy. You could now go in and make this more beautiful and change it to the colors that you would want to, but let's just make this an easy and quick process. Now, maybe let's say you want to understand which of my components drives my energy consumption. So you click on, let's say a pie chart and then you have the question, what 
components actually um, drive my consumption. So you click on components and then you increase the size here a little bit. And actually, let's ask not the question which components, but let's ask the question which component types drive my consumption here. And then you take your component type and actually put it into the legend and then you will take your energy consumption and draw it into the values. And now you see which component types have the highest uh, energy consumption. But to be honest, this could be skewed by how many are there. So what we're going to do is we're not going to look at the sum. We're going to look at each individual component. So we're going to look at the average. And then we will see which are the ones that have the highest energy consumption and which ones are the ones that have the lower energy consumption. If you don't like this view, again, very easy. Just create a Slack bar chart here. And then you have a beautiful view and an easy view of which of these assets are the ones that really drive higher energy consumption than others. And it's as simple as that. Really, you just click at a couple of things and you're done and it's very, very intuitive.